we are really honored tonight. We have, not only do we have Keith, who is great, it was his great uncle, yes, Mike Petroselli, right. but we have his granddaughter here tonight, too. So between the two of them, they're going to fill us and in. And a lot of great nieces. A lot of great nieces. Um, and I don't know what you call Liberty, but. <laughs> Liberty. <laughs> I knew Mike and Babe. Um, so I, this is really special for me because when I was a little girl growing up, my dad went and got his hair cut at, with, with, at Mike. So I, he was like, they were part of the family, <laughs> Babe especially. Uh, Mike was quiet. Babe yes, was not. He was quiet. <laughs> she, he was, but my, Babe wasn't. So, so anyways, take it away, sir. Okay. Take it away, sir. Okay. Well, I apologize ahead ahead of time. Uh, everyone because I had a little bit better copy of this you know more in order and everything in chronological order but unfortunately I couldn't get my computer to print it tonight so <laughs> I'm going with the draft um, we're here tonight to talk about Michelangelo to most people known as Mike Petroselli um, who was a barber in town for somewhere between 50 and 60 years um, he had his own barber shop from sometime in the late 30s until 1971 when he sold it and that was in the uh, depot building down here that everybody kind of probably knows as babes now mm -hmm. um, there's an article here on that move um, maybe that's a good time to pass that <laughs> so there's an article that um, actually talks about when he moved into the depot building Anyway, I will start talking. So, uh, Michelangelo Mike Fumigelli was born 25th of June, 1888. Um, he was born in Grotta Miata, Minarda, near Avellino in the province of Campania. Michelangelo left his little hillside town of Grotta Miata. His destination, original destination, was Baltimore. I don't know why he didn't end up there, but he ended up in Boston in, uh, on 18th of May in 1906. He had some cousins there, and his passenger record said that he was going to stay with his uncle, Michelangelo, also, but Malvarasso, I don't know how you pronounce that, and that was 334 North Street, Boston. Um, I guess he liked in Boston and he was with relatives so he decided to stay. Um, the passenger record said he was traveling with twelve dollars which probably wasn't you know if you looked at other people on the passenger record it probably wasn't that poorly off you know and you had to have a certain amount of money to travel anyway in those days I think you really had to be able to have some money in your pocket or they wouldn't let you get on the boat. So anyway, he, at some point, and I don't have any information, I'm assuming it was in Massachusetts, probably Boston, he went to barber school. And that would have probably been sometime after 1906, but before 1910. Um, he, he later came to Bethel. Um, he's in Bethel pretty early on in the, in the teens, and he meets uh, Amelia, known to us as Babe Fumigelli. They married in May of 1915 in, the in her parents' home. And her parents were Giacom uh, Giacomo Fumigelli and Enriqueta, which I understand the American translation to that is Catherine uh, Locatelli. Um, Amelia and Mike married in May of 1915 in Bethel. Whoops, I already said that, so I got it out of order there. <laughs> Mike was at the time was said to be a barber at the Burrell barber shop and I think that was on down on Main Street somewhere near where where Dave's sandwich shop is somewhere in that area I don't know which building they um, later bought a house on Bridge Street which I don't know how many people here know where Bridge Street was but it was the street on the other side of the bridge down here that was where the Italians all lived is it anybody familiar with that there's actually a picture. Let's show this. Send this picture around. Right down past our place. Yeah. That yeah. one that disappeared in 27. Right in the yeah. 27 yeah. flood. Um, yeah. Mike and Babe had six children: Josephine, born 1917; twins Enriqueta, 
Catherine, other, and known to most of us as Aunt Kitty, the Vermonters anyway. I don't, you probably call her mom, everybody down in Massachusetts calls her mom, right? Yeah. So, um, and Aunt Kitty, uh, was, she just passed away very recently, and she lived to be 104 in what, three quarters of a year? Huh? In eight months, 104. Wow. And was very um, vital until a short time yeah. before her death. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we, um, some of us went to a funeral. I don't remember whose funeral it was, but she was over 100 then. Maybe, huh? Pat's, Pat's funeral. We went, to, we went to the funeral, and across the road from the funeral, there was kind of a restaurant, but more of a bar restaurant. And a few of us said, let's go over there, because we were down from Vermont, and there might have been maybe eight or 10 of us that went. She was one of the, you know, there was a lot of people at that funeral. And she was one of the people who went to the bar. So I thought I was pretty impressed with that when you're over 100. And I remember walking her across, you know, the street and kind of, she had a walking stick so she could walk with it or whatever. But I kind of felt like she was holding me up more than I was holding her arm so that she wouldn't fall down. But anyway, um, the uh, witnesses to the wedding were Genero Verde and Amelia and I don't know how to pronounce this name, but it's T-O-G-N-A-Z-Z-I. Anybody want to try that one? I'm assuming that they were probably also Italians on, the, on uh, Bridge Street. I didn't have a chance to check it, but, I, but I, those names are very familiar for that street. I think there were eight houses down there on that street. Hey, Jeremiah. Uh, eight houses down on the street with Italian residents, and every, every one of them except the house on the end where Babe and Mike were living at the time were lost during the flood. And actually, that one was later. They never moved back in there again. Um, OK. So anyway, I was going through the children, I think, when I interrupted myself with a side story. So Josephine was the oldest, born in 1917. The, the two twins, Kitty and Margaret, were born in 1919. Michelangelo was born in 1920. Thomas James, 1922. And Philomena, known to all of us as Tootie, was born in 1923. OK. Talking about the flood on the flats, um, I understand that Mike got the family out when they knew the flood was coming. And then he got the animals out. And he carefully tied, he had a fishing boat, and he tied it to a tree near the house. Um, when the flood waters receded, he went to retrieve his boat but the, the boat wasn't there, nor was a tree, so that didn't work out very well. Uh, during the, the Depression kind of brought joblessness and homeless men riding the rails coming into town looking for work. Uh, Babe had mentioned that they had a way of knowing which homes would give them work for, for a meal. And uh, that, that knowledge was kind of passed between the guys who were traveling on the rails. You know, they would kind of know, okay, this gal, she'll give you, and probably if it was at Babe's house, they might have got, gotten some grappa because our family had a history of making grappa during, the, during Prohibition and, and selling it. So <laughs> they were arrested for that a few times, I think. <laughs> Although I, I got to add a story here that I didn't have on my list. My grandmother had told me. Um, during Depression, the revenuers would come quite often, and they would come, the federal guys would come with a local constable, and they would come to the house. And of course, a lot of, they had a still in the house, and they would have the, uh, they would have sometimes have gallons of the grappa underneath the floorboards or whatever. Well, this one particular time they, they came to the house, um, Babe's mother said, that the revenuers said, you got any illegal alcohol here, ma'am? And she said, yeah. She said, I got, a, I got maybe seven or eight gallons underneath that wood pile right there if you want to move it up here. <laughs> and they laughed at her. And of course, they looked around a little bit and they left. She said, she said the joke was on them because that's exactly where it was in the wood pile. <laughs> so, yeah. OK, back to the where I was in the story. I forgot. Anyway, so they found their way to her door quite often. She was a good cook, and she baked fresh bread every other day. And there was always work to do in the garden, split wood, that kind of thing, repairs. Mike, uh, Mike was always known for having a very good garden. I went there after, uh, I had Cub Scouts. That was the place that I went. And 
And um, I remember some folks have said tonight that Mike was very quiet. He was very quiet, but he loved his garden. Um, he had a he had a lemon tree. I think he somebody said an orange tree, but I remember him having a lemon tree right outside the door. Is that what you girls remember? It was you know it was fairly tall. I mean it, just enough where you'd have to. It wouldn't really fit in the house very well, but he had lemons on it. And of course, being a Sicilian, you know, area well near that area, not Sicilian really, but the Italians they all love it. They love their lemon trees, so he had to have a lemon tree. Um, his garden was. There were no weeds in it. You know, he was very proud. If he took you out there, he would show you everything about it. And he was quiet. One of the things I, one of the things I remember about Mike is that he, um, he would always be rolling. He would dampen newspapers somehow or other. I don't know if you remember this, Margo, but he would dampen them. And he had some sort of special roller that he would roll them, and they would be, you know, like right from a, t a tight circle, to and he'd get maybe about this big around. And it was hard paper. I mean, like once that dried, it was like wood. And he, so he was getting newspapers from somewhere. I don't know where it was, and he was rolling them. He was always kind of rolling them damp and everything, and he burned them. He had a little stove there that he would burn them in. I don't know if anybody else remembers that. Do you remember it, Joanne? No. So anyway, um, back to where I lose myself in the story here. <laughs> Babe, um, she was a ticket. She was not quiet like uh, Mike was. She was fun-loving, and in the winter she would skip out of the house in her apron with just a sweater on to stay warm, so her husband would think she was hanging clothes to dry, and she'd be out sliding with the kids on the hill. <laughs> two of the, Mike and Babe were really proud of the two, their two sons, um, both serving in World War II. Tom had been stationed in Trinidad before deploying to India, and then to the China Burma Road. Mike was in France, Poland, and Germany, and then he was a guard at the actual Nuremberg trials before being deployed in Korea. And he was a he was pretty much a career military man, wasn't he? Okay. Back to Mike again. Again, because I didn't get these in chronological order, so you're getting them piecemeal here. Mike loved to watch wrestling. That's what I I don't really remember it totally, but I remember hearing about it. He thought that the old wrestling, you know, that was very fake, he, he, he swore it was real. He didn't think it was choreography, you know, and uh, he watched it with a, a lot of relish. His other great pastime was reading the Boston Globe, and I do remember him doing that. He liked to get the Boston Globe. I don't know where he got it. Maybe you could get it right in town. I don't know. Um, Mike made home brew, I understand, although I don't remember that. Do you remember him making home brew? Ann told me that. Mike, you do remember? Anne's the one that told me that. When someone came to the house, was it? But that's in your. What's that? Mother, Eva, Eva made them when they went downstairs to check to see if there was anything. I think they emptied out the coal or something. And she said, You're not leaving until you put everything back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> anyway, I understand one year with, the, with the Mike's home brew stuff. He was a little too generous with the amount of sugar that he put in the bottles. And, um, you know, of course, they didn't have all the technology that so much as we have nowadays with brewers where they can be really sure things aren't going to pop off. So Christmas Eve, some of the caps started popping off, and they told the, I guess they told the kids that it was a reindeer, and they believed it, you know, pretty well. So. <laughs> babe, I understand Babe was a notorious cheater at Canasta. Um, she couldn't stand to lose. When, once when her neighbor and best friend, Mrs. Barella, called at, her out, Babe was, you know, she was like, mm, yeah, she, she wasn't very happy. You know, she, <laughs> Mrs. Barella insisted that she'd been cheating. Babe threw the entire deck of cards up in the air and told her to get the hell out of the house. <laughs> and, of course, they were best friends, so I'm sure she was probably back there the next morning or maybe a couple days later. But <laughs> I, what I, one of the things I remember is going berry picking with Babe. And... Um, and when, and when your mom would come up, especially, we would go, and we'd go up to the local quarries and pick berries. Uh, but, but Babe, like her sister, my grandmother, they were both very afraid of snakes. And if, the, if kids got sick of picking berries, because they were out for they wanted the kids to do all the berry picking, you know? And if the kids got sick of picking berries, they would, uh, <laughs> they, one of the kids would say, what's that, a snake I saw? And then Babe would say, it's time to get out of here. <laughs> 
Um, another thing that Ann tells me that I didn't really remember was that Mike was a staunch Democrat and he loved Roosevelt. Babe was a Republican. And when, when women finally got to vote, they agreed that they would not vote because they would cancel each other out. <laughs> but she said on an election day, Mike would claim to have left something he needed at his barber shop and he'd leave the house to vote and Babe would tell him a neighbor needed a ride somewhere and would head to the polls to vote herself. So they were kind of both <laughs> voting around behind each other's back. Um, I understand Mike was hospitalized only once in his life and it was kind of a short stay. I think he might have had Spanish flu or something, a little bit or something. But, um, and um, he, I was told that the morning he died, he was 93 when he passed away, he told Babe, he said, I feel cold inside. Babe told him she'd make him a nice hot cup of tea and went downstairs to put the kettle on. When she returned, he was gone. What a way to go, huh? Nice In the nice warm bed waiting for a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. um, some other memories that some of them are mine, some are ones that other people have shared with me. Um, Babe was a fantastic knitter and crocheter. Um, she crocheted 40 squares in cream colored cotton, one in each one for each state at the time with a state name and flower. She entered it in one of the competitions at the Tunbridge Fair and won a blue ribbon. She made, of course, made all of her children and grandchildren sweaters and afghans that became loved treasures. I don't know if you have any of her knitting. Oh, yes, she did. Breakfast was a favorite time when she had family. She made pizza free. Free, was it called? Fried dough. Yeah, fried dough, basically fried dough, but it's... With maple syrup. Yeah, and, and bowl, do you want to tell that? Because that would be better if you told it. No, it was always fried dough and maple syrup, not confectionary sugar. That's what she would do. It was the best. That's all we ever had. That's the way we had it all the time. Yeah. And her homemade bread. Sounds good. Donuts. Yeah, I mean, I remember, I'll tell you what, um, the, th the best thing... Babe Alt would always cook for me, you know, tip, being a typical Italian, you get there and they got to feed you, you know, she'd be like, oh, Keithy, I got to make you something or whatever. And she, as she got older, I mean, I remember a lot more being older, uh, she didn't see very well. So you never knew what she was going to put in something. But the, <laughs> the crazy thing was you could see what she was putting in there. You're thinking, I'm going to hate this and it would be great. I mean, she, she, I swear sometimes she put meat in, in, in desserts and it would taste good. But the thing that I remember her making the most was... Uh, a cheesecake, but I think she probably called it ricotta pie because it was mostly ricotta. And I'll tell you what, I tried cheesecake everywhere that I've possibly been, and I've only tasted one that even came close, which which we had in Spain last year, and that was a ricotta cheesecake. You don't remember the one that rose? So, um, I mean, I, I still am trying to find. I tried making it a few times myself, and I I mean, I got maybe 50% of the way there, but I you know it was light. It was really, it's a trick to do that and get it to be light, you know, but anyway, it was, it was delicious. She definitely was a good cook. Mike also would cook. He would, I understand he would make the gravy, which was basically not per se what we would think of as gravy, but it was marinara, you know, marinara sauce. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then he would apparently make, how do you say it? Nochi? Inyaki. Yeah, nochi. And he would boil potatoes and roll, roll up his sleeves to make the pasta. All right, what other things do I have here? Oh, here's another one. So Mike spoke very good English. I mean, I remember Babe and Mike both spoke good English, as most immigrants did, as they get, especially when they get older. But I understand that early on they learned to speak English very well because their dialect, dialects were so different. Babe was from, her family was from the northeast part of Italy and Mike was from more southerly and the dialects were just so different that they couldn't even speak Italian so it was easier for them to learn English. Which is, you know, it's, it's funny but it's kind of neat. Um, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier. Liberty took off, I was going to, I could have had her send pictures because there was Christmas photos but I think we can just send them around afterwards. Um, oh, she's right here. She's found it. <laughs> yeah, let's see if you can find pictures in there. That there's a picture of Babe with Christmas, and you can distribute some of those other pictures too if you want. Um, several days before the Christmas, she would 
she would get pretty excited picking at the packages and shaking them and squeezing them. She'd say, just, let's just open one. <laughs> and everybody say, no, 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 no. And she'd say, I don't care what you people do, I'm opening one. <laughs> and, and our grandmother was the same way, so it's kind of ironic. Um, during World War II, Babe and her daughters, Margie and Tootie, worked at a factory in Windsor. On the way to work, they would stop and tie a few bottles of beer to ropes and stick the rope ends under the rocks in the brook. On their way home from work, they would stop and retrieve their beers, now icy cold from the brook, after a long day's work. Oh, driving. I've been told that Babe was the worst driver, but I, I'm going to have to challenge that because our grandmother was not a good driver either. Uh, I understand that Babe would, uh, you know, she, would, she wouldn't hold the steering wheel straight. She would no, steer it all over the road. <laughs> and the kids in the back would be getting kind of car sick. Uh, the Petroselli's had their 50th one of their anniversary in, nine, in May of 1965. And I, I do remember they got a letter in those days. I think if you made it that far, you you could get a letter from the president, you know, so I, I remember that too. I remember, they, I think they had it on the wall there. They were quite proud of that. Um, so now, barbershop comment uh, things. Lib, where are you? You took off again. You're supposed to be keep staying here. She's sitting on chairs. Oh, there are a lot of people out there with chairs. Hey, Eric. Okay, so the barbershop. I've got some pictures of the depot back in the days when it was the barbershop. You can see the barber pole there. Um, I actually have one of these. Um, one of uh, Mike's uh, granddaughters um, gave gave me the uh, one of his straight razors from the barber shop, and here and there's a picture at Burrell's barber shop down on down on Main Street, I think, and that's probably taken in the 20s sometime, I think. I don't, although I don't know the year, so you can hand those around. Um, I have personal experience getting my hair cut there because I I went there most of my early years until I started cutting my own hair. <laughs> but I, I remember, you know, if you went in there, I, I was pretty small. I had to sit, you know, Mike would, you couldn't just sit in the chair. You wouldn't be up high enough. Even though Mike wasn't a tall guy, you had to, you had to sit on the briefcase there. <laughs> so one time, one time uh, my cousin who was 10 years older than me, I'm thinking he might have been 16, so that would have made me six or seven. Um, we both went to get our haircuts together for some reason, you know, it was just what we kind of were doing at the time. And, and we um, got into the barber shop there, and, and my cousin, he being a 16-year-old, I think he was going to the prom maybe or something, and, and he said to Uncle Mike, he said, Mike, he said, I, I don't, just want you to give me a little trim. i got to look good because I'm going to the dance or whatever it was. And, and uh, Mike, said, Mike said, oh, I'll give you a haircut from the old country. Don't you worry. And Charlie said, no, no, I just want to trim. Well... He got a haircut, I think, from the old country, but it looked to me, I can kind of remember, like it, like somebody stuck a bowl on your head. You know, it was like really curved. And, uh, needless to say, Charlie was not really tickled with the haircut. We also cut my, my son here for kindergarten. He was old, my son was five, so that's like 50 years ago. And of course, my grandfather was really old at the time. And it was really pretty uneven, but that was my favorite school picture. So which, which, who we? From Barry. Oh, Barry, he got Barry's hair, he too. Barry's nice. Hair. Yeah, that was quite a picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, other things that people have remembered, um, Mike liked to, he would clean the sidewalk every Saturday in front of the house. You know, he was very proud of how he kept the house and everything, and he would do that. And I guess that was a tradition in, in Italy, too, to do that, to be out there. You know, like the lemon tree, they carried a lot of those tradition together. Um, another story um, that I didn't personally witness, but I think Joanne has kind of told me, and I've heard other people tell me, is that Mike kept condoms in the in the um, barber shop, and he kept them on the bar, kind of behind the, you know, where the barber's chair was, and every now and then, you know, Babe would come in there, and she would see him, and she'd throw him away and get really angry, and he'd say, oh, you know, the boys from Massachusetts, they want those, you know, or whatever. But, <laughs> But uh, I guess it was quite a kind of a thing. I'm sure he was. He, she, he was more timid than she was. Yeah, <laughs> so it was. I was with her one time. And really, Faith was a tall woman. Mm -hmm. So when she walked in there, she towered over like so. <laughs> yeah. um, it was when she walked in. She was 
he was so quiet, she was a little louder. So when she walked in, I know all the guys were like, oh, here she comes, what's going to happen now? <laughs> but it was always that jar with the guns. You go right to it. <laughs> in her eyes, that was married men cheating on their wives. Uh, that's what that so what was in the jar? Condoms. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, didn't, Uncle Mike would have to fish them out of the trash while he were throw them and he'd use that money. He kept them there. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, I don't know if I have a heck of a lot else. I mean, we can. There's a lot of people here to answer questions. I've got some, you know, some other hand around things. Some things that, rather than read them all, you know, uh, about my uh, retiring. I, oh, it says right here after 66 years of barbering. Wow. But I think I think um, close to 60 of them were probably in Bethel, if not more. So, if you want to. Yeah. Some pictures, this is uh, Babe and Mike's wedding photo. Margo tells me that it's on, it was a tin photo? Tin, yes. Yeah, probably a tin type. It's supposedly the um, tie was drawn in. in uh, oh. oh. Oh, there you go. Nice. This one here is a family photo. I, you know, uh, Margo helped me put the names of the folks on there. We don't really know that the twins are one or each on each side. Either either this is Kitty and this is Margaret, or this is Kitty and this is Margaret. Um, it's kind of, Liberty commented it, that it doesn't really like, look like a photo, so I'm wondering if it's a hand touch photo or something. Maybe somebody's familiar with photos and they can tell. This is a picture of Babe and Mike when they were yeah, older. Yeah. I'll hand that around. So how old was he when he landed in Boston before he ended up? Um, you know, I had that written. I think I had that on my update, of but it probably on the computer. Uh, he wasn't terribly old. Um, was he fourteen when he came? Huh? Was he fourteen when he came? Um, he came by himself, so yes. I don't know. Let's see if it says on. I didn't think he was. For some reason, I was thinking he was. He came in nineteen oh six. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking it said eighteen on it. Um, and it actually says something over to the right, and I don't know if this applies to him, but it almost looks like it does. And I tried to look this word up, and the closest I could come was um, problem with talking or whatever. And I'm wondering if it just meant because he couldn't speak English. Now you're landing in, it didn't say that next to any of these other Italians, but somebody who's an expert on that kind of thing maybe could, could uh, answer it. So I'll send these pictures around. What's that? When did he die? He died in 1980. I think it was May of 1980. Babe died in 1990. Um, there's some other family photos. Here's one of this. Pass on the other way. Pass on that way instead. Oh, pass on that way? Well, you're the one that's supposed to be doing, ordering this passing, so. Okay, well, send them around. You can send that whole pile around. I want to talk about this picture here because here's, here's Babe and Mike and Margot on her wedding day. And I have a kind of a funny story to tell about Margot because this girl over here was named after Margot. And you might ask yourself, why was she named after Margot? Her name is Liberty. Well, um, so my grandmother had a bunch of pictures like a collage on the wall. And my grandmother was kind of famous for writing on the pictures. Only she wrote on, there was a picture of Margot and she wrote, she didn't write Margot on it. She wrote Liberty Santa Maria, who was one of my other cousins. And on the picture below it, she probably wrote Margo, you know? And so, Lociato. So anyway, um, I saw the picture and, and, and Margo was beautiful. And I was a little kid and I was probably Liberty's age. And I was like, who's that beautiful girl, Graham? You know, and, and I, I don't know what happened, but anyhow, somehow or rather it got to be Liberty Santa Maria in my mind. And I thought that name was just fantastic. So, yeah. you know, she was named, you know, she was an immigrant and yeah. she, daughter. And so she was named, you know, to be an American. And, so it just was kind of a funny story because it was only it was only a couple of years ago that I found out that the, that the picture I had seen was Margot. Uh, I think Ann maybe posted it on Facebook or something, or I, maybe I posted it and Ann said, "What a that's a beautiful picture, you know, of Margot." And I think it was your graduation picture. She said, "Oh, that's a beautiful picture of Margot," and and I said, "Margot, what are you talking about?" <laughs> so that's been a family joke. <laughs> So I don't know if anybody else has other questions that oh, I, I can or not. When, uh, well, just, uh, he landed in Boston in 1906, and right. then I think you said in 1910 he came to Bethel. I, I'm a little unsure about when he came, but he was here in around. Why did he come to Bethel? 
That's a very good question, but I have a feeling because there were a lot of immigrants in Bethel, you know, that were working in the quarries and stuff, and they probably needed haircuts. And there was some sort of a coordination between, you know, Massachusetts and in Bethel. There were a lot of people coming and going. I've noticed that in papers and stuff. As a matter of fact, Mike would go to Boston occasionally and work as a barber, and then he would come back and, you know, in those early years when he was still working up here. He worked in White River a little bit. and but Yeah, so I don't know the answer to that. There's a lot of questions, you, you know, you can speculate answers for, but to know them for sure, I don't. Where, where in Massachusetts were they, had they settled first? Uh, well, he, had, he was in Boston for some time, and I don't know how many years, because I know he kind of was in Bethel or around 1910, and he might have been here even before that, but he, he I, I, for some reason, he was supposed to be going to Baltimore. I, one of his granddaughters has told me, and somehow or other, he got he came to Boston instead, and he had family here, and there's, you know, I mentioned Where it here. He meet What's that? Where did he meet Bing? I'm assuming he met her right here in Bethel, you know, so. I mean, I don't know if he was living in a tenement house when they were, yeah. Because Babe, I mean, Babe's parents lived in one of the, so down on Bridge Street there where there were the eight houses and they were all Italians, you know, and they were walking down to the stone, you know, stone yards just down here by where Castings is and walking down there each day and, you know, probably, you know, telling each other stories on the way and stuff. and. And that picture that's there really kind of shows how much area was there before the flood thinned things out. And you can go down there and walk around and find uh, Bill Johansson and Linda and I went down there and yeah. found some of the foundations yeah. years ago yeah. in, in the group. Um, but the the house that the the house that was on in the corner is where that Mike, Babe and Mike had bought. And then that one. That one was in the. That was the only one standing after the flood. All the houses that were small, kind of down on the flats, they were gone. They were totally gone. That house, they debated whether they would, you know, whether they would. There it went a couple of years before they decided what to do with it. And I think the Red Cross kind of stopped, stepped in because it was an emergency and said, you know, they were going to try to help rebuild it or whatever. And they finally just said, let's just get them in a new house. And I think that's how they ended up on South Main Street, is you know, with a little bit of um, fendangling to get there. Uh, What's that? She was a fumigelli. Okay. Yeah. They were the they were blonde. She was pretty blonde haired, you know, like in some of the, some of the pictures it looks darker. But I always remember having a little bit lighter hair. But the the northern Italians, a lot of them were more blonde and and um, as a matter of fact, yeah, yeah, and she did, yeah, in Bologna, in that area, and she was she was blondish hair. Four foot ten and a blue eye. Yeah, and Babe was quite tall. I don't know how tall she actually was. Obviously, in some of these pictures, she's, you know, she's either shrunk or she might. I have a feeling in this one here, she's not standing on the level ground with Mike because I always remember her being taller than Mike. So, but. It's hard to tell the story that Mike taught me how to shave. Who is that telling the story? Yeah, and I had several haircuts from him during the summertime when we were up here during the summer. Oh, nice. And at one point, Shaving wrong. Let me teach you how to shave. Yeah. Yeah. I never got to be old enough with him doing it. He he told you to do it down, not up. Oh, interesting. You have to have a very sharp one to do it. Do you know anything about the barber shop in Boston? Yeah, like the one I I think I had a picture. I don't know if you saw that. Maybe this is one he showed you with. Maybe you'll recognize it. That's one of his raisins. But, um, so what, somebody else is... Oh, do you know anything about the, the, the barber school where he learned I, I really don't, and I haven't had time to investigate that. I would probably, you know, I'd like to put addendums to this or whatever, but I kind of forgot that I was doing this until just very recently. So, <laughs> so that's the lack of the organization of the printing and everything. But. So what year did the depot become a barbershop? 
1942, I think that this article is the best I could find on it is one of these articles tells it. I'm pretty sure it was 42. Oh, it was just a yeah, yeah. So this one was from the Herald, uh, April 28th, 1942. Mike Petroselli has moved his barbershop from the Smead Building, and I apologize because I don't know all the buildings in town. I've heard the name Smead, but I don't know which one it was. I'm just, I'm guessing it had to be down on Main Street, one of the buildings down there. Um, to the former waiting room in the Central Vermont Passenger Depot, which has been used the past few months as a gift shop by E.S. Rude. B.S. Smead, the one probably he was running from, proprietor of the State Liquor Agency, has moved the agency from the former Marsh Furniture Store to the place vacated by Petroselli. And that's the best I found about it. So I'm assuming he was probably down on South Main Street from, you know, from probably before 1920 all the way to to there I'm guessing so so was it um, something that they didn't want to use it as a depot for railroads that they started turning into yeah. a gift shop I don't know what happened with the railroad I think I have heard that before but I don't know why they stopped maybe when they stopped having stops there they just tried to decided to try and you know rent it out and I don't know when did did the, the train was still stopped in there yes. while the barber shop was Boy, there. Yes. Oh. Uh -huh. That's where yeah. we would go first see my grandfather as we came in on the train. Oh, okay. Okay. Come in and get a haircut. Still, it was still active. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't remember what uh, year the railroad the stopped there. Like sixties. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember. So there was like Four. passenger. Yes. The there were yeah. passenger trains into the sixties. Yeah, I don't really remember that. I guess I'd heard it, but I didn't remember that they... When you guys would come in, that's where you'd come in, too. Oh, that's where you came in? Right yes. there by the... Right there. Oh, that's neat. Yes. Yeah, and baby would see them come by the house, get in the car and go pick them up. Right. Oh. Well, there you go. But it didn't always be a gift shop and a barbershop. Um, was it... It was, no, no, it wasn't always. Uh, it was just a depot for passengers and trains when it first was built? Oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, like Peavine? Mm -hmm. Well, no, for the, for the White River Line. Yeah, White River, River Line. Line. And Peavine. Yeah. Yeah. When, when, it was, when Peavine yeah. existed, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, wonder, I don't know why during 1942 it happened. It was something... Maybe just, well, there was a gift shop that might have been out. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I think at one time there was, back then, there was at least two and maybe a third barber shop because there was a barber shop in the oh in too the hotel yeah. the old no. hotel right. on this end you got three the with the, saying there were like three barbers yeah they could be, but that's town. not you know it, the town was booming back in the late yeah yeah there were a lot of people here so they needed a lot of haircuts and i mean the shoe factory was there even and mm -hmm. yeah. This fella, so do you mind me asking what year, what year, I don't know how old you are or whatever, but what year you might have been get, learn, get your haircuts and stuff from Mike? I mean, were they in the depot? Must have been. It was 441, yeah. like 70s. So, middle, middle 50s. Oh, nice. And they were probably in the depot then. Oh, yes. Yeah. Does Babe have anything to do with the naming of Babe's Bar? <laughs> I don't believe so, but that's kind of ironic is that you say that, that, isn't it? I have to tell them that. So they don't, they don't know any of it? No, they probably don't. I don't think I've ever talked to either one of them about that, because it, it never occurred to me until you just said that, that it was Babe and Babe. They were probably cousins. Oh, you have? What's that? You have mentioned it to him? Oh, okay, yeah, cool. Shared yeah. a picture. That's yeah. yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. No? No? Yeah. 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 She's got to be laughing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> she was built like a blue ox. I mean, she was a big She was definitely feisty. And oh, my yes. grandmother was too. But Now, did Babe, Babe was the only one of the two that dro ever drove, right? Mike never drove, did he? No. Yeah, so Babe was the driver and... And he had to hurry up if she was going someplace to get in the car. <laughs> I can imagine. So when did it change from a barbershop to a 
Did it change from a barbershop to a bar in one time? Well, I, it was a, I don't know if there was anything in between. I know I was getting haircuts in the 70s there okay. because I continued to get haircuts from the fellow, and name was Richard Rice, I think, yeah. who was the barber there afterwards. And then, it was, and then, it was a bar like in the 70s because I was on the Board of Adjustment. And, Nancy and it was a bar. Yeah, so probably it went right to a bar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was the deep. I didn't know if there was anything in between it, but I yeah. suspect not. If you're saying that, yeah. Richard Rice was a, a working high school graduate. So oh, was he? Yeah. Yeah. He graduated with my mom. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, and I think he worked for Mike a little bit there before he bought it, right? Probably. I'm thinking. I didn't like him. <laughs> you, didn't like his, <laughs> you didn't like his haircuts, or you didn't? I didn't like his haircut. Yeah. <laughs> my first haircut was Jack Joyce. I went to the competition. Jack Joyce? No, I know the name, but I don't remember. Well, Jack Joyce was down in Dave's Sandmore's sandwich shop, okay. the last, the last storefront there. I don't know if you remember. It was M and R S L. Yeah. Yeah. And then Jack Joyce's barber shop. Right. He sat your back to the couple wells, but for some reason we went there. But Jack's wife was. Um, she worked for the hot lunch program. Oh, Mrs. Joyce. Yes. Was there for 160 years? <laughs> yeah, she was. She, she was there for about 160 years. Very nice lady. Yeah. I don't now remember what her first name was because we always called her Mrs. Joyce. But yeah, nice lady. And then of course the credit union. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. The Hotel Emory. Yeah. But yeah, I'm sure you had your choices for haircuts. Yeah. Depending on whether you needed condoms or not, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> What'd you say? No, no condoms. <laughs> yeah, no condoms. <laughs> All right, let's yeah, hear it. Can you come in here, Kathy? We can. Yeah, come on. I think you can be able to crunch them down there. That's what he always said. And Babe liked to go pick a beer before she took the kids with her. So one day they went out. I get up quite a quarry. Yeah, that's where we used to go all the time, every there time. There wasn't before. very many dairy. Yeah. So she said to the kids, put grass in your bucket. And she put beer on the top. And she said, well, when you walk by Mrs. McGrone, she said, you know what, Mrs. Hold your bucket. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like yeah, Babe. He did exactly what Babe did. That's and so they walked around the block. And he said, two minutes later, this is McGrone and all the kids were headed up to the court. <laughs> <laughs> Got them all, didn't they? Them dim. <laughs> Petrocellis took all the berries. Big surprise for me. Okay. I would have, if I didn't find out last night or this morning or whatever, I probably would have. <laughs> I had a little bunch of information, so it wasn't like I was totally shooting from the hip. I just didn't have anything organized, which pretty much was the same thing as when I landed here. But. So come up, look at the pictures, ask Keith any questions you'd like to. And the next one for all of you that are going to be coming back is about Wickham High School and the one room schools and the school that burned. Not the new school, the school that burned. Um, we'll have different things about the one room school, but if, as I, when I asked Bucky Ocean if he would come, he said, if I'm still here. <laughs> so Bucky Ocean, Mary Floyd, I'm not sure who else, but they're going to come and talk about nice. school. Right. That'll be our next one. Thanks. So we're going to keep this going. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.